es la Paul, are you there? Um, okay, uh, Paul is not audible. If we could have someone else pray for us. Um, Let this be for the glory of your name. Pray and declare this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Hello. you. Uh, I could not hear the first part of the prayer, but then yeah, finally I was able to hear. Yes. I think it's a time lag Hello. in the transmission. Yeah, there's okay. a time lag in the transmission, so it's uh, so I could not hear, and then finally I could hear the yeah the latter part of the prayer. I was able to hear. Thank you so much for praying. Yes. All right then. In that case, we shall. Um, get started with a class. So last week, we looked at Colossians chapter 1. And then uh, we moved into Colossians chapter 2. And we just looked at one main uh, concept, where these people, the Colossians, uh, were in danger of being led away by wrong philosophies. And so uh, in verse 8, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul tells them, don't get deceived by uh, empty philosophies, because these philosophies do not have any power, is what he says. And there are two kinds of empty philosophies that he mentions, uh, those which are based on the tradition of men, and those which are based on the basic principles of the world or uh, you know like it says in the modern versions based on the elemental spiritual forces of the world so uh, he wants the colossian believers not to get deceived by these two types of empty philosophies uh, so the tradition of men would probably refer to all the rituals and the ceremonies associated with uh, judaism uh, which you know, some were promoting as being very necessary for salvation. Uh, on the other hand, when we refer to the elemental spiritual forces, uh, that would in a way refer to angel worship and, you know, uh, wanting to establish contact with spirits, um, things like that. So these are the two kinds of empty philosophies that Paul asks the Colossian believers to avoid. And why does he say that we, they should avoid it? Because Christ is the one who is fully divine. So in verse 9, he says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So when Jesus took on a human form, it's not as though only a little bit of the divinity of God was inside that human body. No, it says the fullness of the deity, the entire divine and divinity of God was inside that human body. So uh, he is obviously the head over every power and authority. Like it says in verse 10, he is the head over every power and authority because in him, in his physical body, all the fullness of the deity rested. Um, and so in verse 10, it, it says, uh, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So in him, the fullness of the deity is residing. And through him, we can be made full in our lives. Um, in what sense? It, you know, John 10, if you remember, brings out that very nicely. Uh, if we could have someone you know, turn to John chapter 10, verses 7 to 10, and read out that, please. John chapter 10, verses 7 to 10, which talks about the kind of fullness which the followers of Christ have. John 10, 7 to 10, please. Yeah, I know if you could have your Bibles with you. Um, yeah, and if any one person can turn to John chapter 10, if you could read out verses 7 to 10, please. John 10, 7 to 10. 
Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If any one enters by me, he will saved. He will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So in this passage, Jesus says that anyone who you know, uh, chooses to come into a life through me, in me, they will have, um, he says, they will go in and out and find pasture, is what he says in verse 9. Uh, so he is the true shepherd who can provide us with fullness, a full life, which is what you know is repeated in verse 10, where Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So uh, the previous verse, which talks about, you know, they will come in and go out and find pasture, that talks about unrestricted movement. You know, you have the freedom uh, to, to be able to move about and be able to fulfill all that God has for you. Uh, a prisoner, on the other hand, a slave, on the other hand, has no freedom of any kind. In everything, he's restricted. In, in, in his everyday life, he can't decide what he wants to do, what he does not want to do, because he's a slave. You know, he has to follow the slave master's orders. On the other hand, what Jesus says is, if you come to me, he says, you will come in and go out and find pasture. You have the freedom uh, to to live in all that you know we are meant to have um, there are uh, no restrictions except of course to avoid sin because that will only you know uh, ruin our lives uh, so uh, so jesus says you will find pasture and you will in fact have your uh, a life that is to the full in me so this is basically what you know paul is referring to over here uh, he says it is christ in whom the fullness of the deity is residing. So if you place your faith in this Christ, then he will bring you to fullness. Uh, and so uh, Paul urges the Colossians and he says, you know, do not be deceived and led away by the uh, empty philosophies, which are trying to distract you from your, uh, you know, following of Christ. So, um, now if we could maybe look at verses 11 up to verse 15 yes if we could have someone read out for us uh, so we are looking at colossians chapter 2 and if someone could read out for us all the way from 11 to 15 colossians 2 11 to 15 In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting up the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has met alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So here he's talking about two things in what way Jesus is superior to the tradition of men and also in what way Jesus is superior to these elemental spiritual forces. So uh, we look at the first two verses, uh, verses 11 and 12 over there. Um, Paul is saying this, what Jesus has to offer is far superior to what the traditions of men can offer. So you can undergo all the uh, mosaic rituals and you will still not have the perfection which Jesus Christ alone can give 
and so he refers to one of their most important mosaic rituals which is the uh, you know the the ceremony of circumcision because uh, this was supposed to set them apart as the people of god so every male child uh, would be circumcised you know to indicate that this child it belongs to the living god okay so uh, that was the very important uh, ceremony which would set them apart as god's people so now paul is referring to that and he says even though you know in the old testament this was considered such an important ceremony this ceremony cannot even do for you what christ has done what christ has done is far superior you know when the, on the eighth day when they would take that newborn baby and they would uh, do the circumcision what was basically removed you know you just have some skin and some tissue being removed uh, but over here what jesus has removed he he says your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off so this is a far superior circumcision in in the human circumcision just a little bit of skin and tissue of that little baby would be taken off but here your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off you know that's the uh, the uh, romans chapter 6 explains that to us right where there we are told in romans 6 6 uh, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with so the entire the the, the person that you were um the old spirit being you know that um, okay let's let's uh, you know break up this whole concept we all are spirit beings right we all are spirit beings uh, we have a uh, you know we have a soul which is made up of the mind will and emotions and we live inside a human body so we are spirit beings but when we were born into this world we were born as sinful fallen spirit beings because we inherited that from adam so every little baby that is born it is born as a sinful fallen spirit being and then what happens at the moment of salvation romans chapter 6 verse 6 tells us that in that moment when we place our faith in jesus christ that old sinful fallen spirit being is literally killed crucified are you aware that you were actually crucified that you were killed by god himself you were crucified with jesus you actually died you you stopped living you literally died with him you were crucified with him and then of course you were also raised with him you know so it's not that you stayed dead how were you raised in that moment through the divine work of the holy spirit he rebirthed you as a new living spirit being so the person that you were earlier that sin- sinful fallen spirit being actually died was actually crucified so what rose up with jesus you know uh, uh, it glorified what rose up along with jesus was this new living spirit which the holy spirit had given birth to so what you were that person is actually dead so this is a far superior circumcision ceremony where the entire sinful spirit being that you were was completely put off was completely crucified so a human ceremony at the most it can only symbolically point towards what jesus you know uh, would achieve later so uh, the human ceremony was pointing towards what jesus would accomplish so the real circumcision is done by jesus because uh, with him when he died to represent us we died along with him we were crucified with him that person that you were born as that sinful fallen spirit being that you were born as that person literally got killed that person literally was crucified with christ died with christ and when you rose up it was not that person rising up no it was what the holy spirit has had had, had you know rebirthed as a living new spirit that is who you were transformed into so uh there's a huge difference so that level of circumcision is not something that you know the tradition of men can ever achieve which is why in the old testament even though after undergoing that circumcision ceremony even as the child grew up 
the child would grow up with you know in in sinful ways on the other hand after jesus christ has done this divine circumcision i know for all of us we can actually live in a new way we don't have to be slaves to sin so this is a far superior circumcision which has given us the power to live in a, a righteous and holy life we could not have that under the old uh, covenant but we are able to live in a completely new victorious way because the circumcision which jesus has done is so permanent he has literally killed off the old 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 uh, spirit being that was you and you have been rebirthed as a new creation um so um yeah uh so this is regarding the tradition of men in what way what jesus is offering is superior to what the tradition of men offers let's look at the other aspect about uh, how he is also superior to the spiritual elemental forces so that would be in verses 13 to 15 where paul explains that um when we were living in sin earlier you know when we were living as sinful fallen spirit beings who are helpless who are under the control of the evil one who are under the control of the uh, spirit of the air is what it says so we were under under his control we were helpless when we were in that condition we were all prisoners because we were in legal debt to satan you know we have covered this concept earlier but just as a reminder so once we sinned against god we became debtors we owed god our obedience and we had failed to give him that obedience so now we were in debt to him god deserves perfect obedience perfect righteousness when we withheld that from him we became debtors we failed to give god what a what you know is owed to him what rightfully belongs to him we failed to give it and so we are in debt to god we were debtors and so when we were in this fallen debt condition you know um, satan swooped in and he took over he because we were helpless we were no longer under god's covering he could come and take over you know uh, take us into slavery so we became slaves to satan we became slaves to um, sin and so he always uh, satan always held this over our heads you know that you are debtors you are separated from god uh, unless an atoning sacrifice is made to propitiate for your debt indebtedness you know someone comes and pays the debt on your behalf until that is done you know your your debts are above your you know over your head and satan holds that over your head and in that way he was holding us prisoner so it's like as if there's a long list of you know debts which each one of us owes every time i sin i am in debt to god so this is long list in fact if you were to produce the legal document and look at the number of debts which i know which i owe to god it's such a huge amount can never ever be repaid so that long list of debts which we owe to god what did jesus christ do in that in that moment when we placed our faith in him you see it was all our all that legal document containing all my debts was nailed to the cross that would be your verse 14 where it says having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us he has taken it away nailing it to the cross so that long list of debts which we owe to god that was always standing against us condemning us holding us in bondage to satan we were in that helpless condition but uh, jesus he cancelled that debt by paying the price for us he took those legal documents which show that we are you know in debt he nailed it to the cross and he paid it we were unable to pay those debts ever he paid it so now those demonic forces can no longer have any control over us because now we are under a uh, under a new master you know now jesus has legally purchased us so now 
the demonic forces no longer have any control over us. So verse 15, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So earlier, they had become our slave masters. They could boss us around. They could meddle in our lives and bring sickness and you know poverty and strife and violence and all that. There was so much that they could do as our slave masters, these demonic powers. But after having purchased us and set us free from our indebtedness, now those things cannot, those, those uh, spirits can no longer have any control over us. We are free. We are under new management. And our new manager is very possessive about us. So we are under his protection. We are under his care. So in that you know, moment of victory on the cross, once he has you know, uh, defeated the evil forces on the cross, he literally, in the spiritual realm, all the angels who were watching, all the cherubim and the seraphim who were, who were watching, in fact, even all the demons which were watching, in front of everyone, he displayed that he has now gained victory for us humans. So on our behalf, he triumphed over these evil powers and he declared and he said, see, now you have no control over any person who comes to me and places themselves under uh, and, and places themselves under my protection. So now you cannot touch them anymore. They will be mine. So he declared to them that, um, that you know, he has triumphed over them. And now through Jesus, we can have, we can enjoy that triumph. We can enjoy that victory. The word that he uses, uh, that is used in this verse, it says, having disarmed the powers and authorities. It's like as if, you know, all these powers and authorities, even if we were to think, use modern language. It's like as if all these powers and authorities, they had these guns and these revolvers. They were holding it over our heads. They were holding us in bondage. No, we were in that position. But now, all that weaponry, all those arms have been taken away. So if you were to you know, use this kind of modern um, analogy, now those demonic powers do not have guns or revolvers or anything, rifles in their hands, to wield against us. Which is why now all that they do is they use trickery. They try to use empty philosophies. They try to deceive us with lies. They try to distract us into sin where we will, where we will not be under the protective covering of God. They're using all of these tactics because now, once we become believers, they have no rifles against us. They have no weapons against us. So actually, they have been disarmed. So we, if we were to claim the scriptures and stand on the scriptures and declare and say, because this is what is my new status, this is what God says I can have in Christ, they're actually helpless. They don't have revolvers and rifles to forcefully hold over our head and keep us in bondage. They can only try to trick us. They can only try to draw us away from the protection of God's covering. They can use all these... Um, uh, strategies and schemes, but the power, the weapons which they had, they have been disarmed. They do not have that anymore. So Paul is saying, why on earth do you want to go and place yourself, you know, under those spirits and you know establish contact with them? Because you know these people are indulging in spirit worship and all that. So don't do that. He says, Jesus Christ disarmed those uh, demons. They cannot even have any hold over you if you are a true believer. So place yourself under Christ. Do not be deceived by the elemental forces of the world. So uh, Je what Jesus has done is more powerful than the human circum circumcision which people can offer. What Jesus has done has disarmed the spirits. And they can have no hold over us if we claim the scripture. Because now we are under Christ's covering. We are safe under him. And, and he is the head over every authority. Okay, so um, this is what he brings out over here in these verses. So therefore, because of that, he says in verse uh, 16, um, maybe we could have someone read out all the way from 16 to 19. Yeah, uh, we are in Colossians chapter 2. If someone could read out verses uh, 16 to 19 for us, please. So let let no one judge you in food or in drink 
or regarding a festival or a new moon or Shabbat, which are a shadow of things to come, but the sub substance is of Christ. Let, let, no, uh, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Yes, thank you. So uh, here, because you know uh, the elemental forces cannot offer you something better, human traditions cannot offer you something better, therefore, verse 16, he says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with or with regard to a religious festival or a, you know a sabbath day he says because earlier these were the shadows which were pointing to jesus uh, verse 17 it says these are a shadow of the things that were to come the reality however is found in christ so now that the reality now that christ has come we don't need the shadows anymore so um, what were the some of the shadows that he's mentioning over here earlier they had to be very careful about what they eat and drink because it was symbolically pointing towards those who are clean and those who are unclean so if you follow the uh, food um, food rules which god has laid down and they eat only the clean uh, meat and not the unclean meat that would be an indication that they are a clean, set-apart people for God. You know, so they would avoid eating certain foods to show that they have been set apart for, for God and they are clean in Him. So it was symbolic. So every time they would avoid eating pork, every time they would avoid eating prawns. Basically, they are saying, see, by, by keeping away from these unclean foods, we are indicating that we are set apart for God and we are clean in him but now the reality has come now it uh, the our clean our our cleanse uh, what's the noun form of clean <laughs> our cleanliness uh, okay fine maybe yeah uh, our our cleansed condition is not dependent on what we eat or not eat now who does the cleansing it is Jesus who has done who has you know cleaned us perfectly totally so now you know you don't need to avoid certain foods to be declared clean because Jesus on by his sacrifice has completely totally cleansed us. So now if you're still holding on to the food rules and say, Oh, I need to avoid this food, I need to avoid that food, avoiding those foods is not going to make you clean. In no way is it going to make you cleaner than you know anyone else. It's Christ alone who can completely cleanse us. So therefore, he says, don't let anyone judge you by the way you eat or drink. God, Christ Jesus has declared you clean. So keeping uh, food rules is not in any way going to change you know, uh, your status because Christ has completely cleansed you, even regarding the Sabbath day. Because uh, always in the Old Testament, you know, Jesus said to the Israel, God said to the Israelites, he said, keep the Sabbath because you have been set apart for me. But now, observing the Sabbath day is not going to make you set apart. The only thing which can make you set apart is, you know, being in Christ. Because he's the one who's going to completely circumcise and take away your old, you know, old self and make you new. So uh, what's going to make you set apart now is not following the Sabbath day, but rather following Jesus. Only that can make you set apart. Um, and uh, after having uh, you know talked about those food rules and these sabbath day and religious day uh, uh, rituals he goes on to say uh, in the same way do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you so um, that was regarding the traditions of men now he's talking about this uh, this spirit worship so you had these people uh, who would you know fast and um, not eat for many days um, give up all kinds of um, normal life 
and you know live in uh, in a very painful condition like ascetics you know they would go away from the comforts of home uh, live in a very um, um, you know in a very secluded place where there are no comforts nothing and and go without food for many many days they would do all this you know all this false humility to establish contact with those spirit beings it's very demonic actually very dangerous uh, they were thinking that they are doing something very spiritual but they and in india this is something that yeah a concept that we would be familiar with you know we are familiar with these um, i don't know what to call them um, they call themselves rishis you know i mean um, so they basically they they will they give up all the comforts of life you know they they wander about they don't have a home and uh, they they starve themselves for many many days and their idea is that if they go through all of that then you know, then, then they will become possessed by a spirit and then that uh, you know that through that spirit they will be able to do certain uh, certain demonic rituals and things like that so those sages you know what they do in india this was something similar to that so there was this sect of um, jews who had begun to go into this kind of a weird teaching where they would give up all the comforts of life and uh, they would you know fast and uh, and pray and do all of that so that they can establish contact with spirit beings and then they would you know talk about all the things which they have seen in the spiritual realm um you know it says in verse in verse 18 such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind so in in, in once they would make contact with the spirit beings they would have visions they would see things and they would say see i have seen this and they would talk about what they have seen in great detail and everyone would think oh my goodness they had an encounter with supernatural beings and this was this was what was revealed to them this must be great wisdom so people would have all these wrong impressions about such people and such encounters and this was all highly dangerous and uh, uh, so he says do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you because such people they are puffed up with idle notions what they are thinking and what they are you know um, so uh, impressed about is actually just idle it's worthless it's of no use so he, he says you know uh, don't let such people you know uh, point fingers at you and say ah when did you ever have a vision or an encounter on the other hand see i went to the spiritual realm and i saw all these things and i heard these things told to me when did you believers ever have any such encounters you know they may say that so he says don't let such people disqualify you so don't you know you can ignore what they are saying so um just for uh, you know for us to have some detail about this first century you know judaism where they uh, there was this one sect of judaism that was going into all this mysticism um they had written all these um, um all these books uh, which you know were actually not true scriptures they were called you know this was um, a few years before the birth of jesus um, um you know, there was there was a lot of writing that was done so you had something called testament of job being written the apocalypse of abraham that was written the ascension of isaiah which was written you see they're using familiar names which you know the uh, which would be there in your old testament scriptures but even though the they're using the names of characters from the true scriptures these writings were written by uh, people who were in no way influenced by the holy spirit so um, some you know some of these writings are today we call them as apocryphal writings so these were all fake writings so the testament of job is not providing any true history about what happened to job it's a lot of uh, fake stories in the same way the apocalypse of abraham is not really giving you any historical details about the real abraham it it goes into all kinds of myths and legends and all of that so in these writings um in the testament of job you know it talks about how the three daughters of job 
uh, they are given the language of angels and they begin to praise god in those uh, in those tongues so it's talking about some kind of encounter with spirit beings and uh, the use of some kind of of a spirit language so you see even before uh, jesus came already satan who had been trying to produce some kind of a counterfeit of what uh, the holy spirit would release you know in later on in new testament times so in the same way the, in the apocalypse of abraham it talks about how uh, an angel is supposed to come to abraham and then he teaches him some kind of uh, uh, of some kind of a hymn in a heavenly language and so abraham begins to recite that and even as abraham is reciting that the angel joins him and in reciting it so in these in these false writings what is said they say in this way they the humans joined with the angels in worshiping and praising god was basically what was said um for instance in this ascension of isaiah and the apocalypse of zephaniah what they basically say is that isaiah and zephaniah they had encounters with these spirits and then with the help of the spirits they began to praise god in a heavenly language they they joined the angels in worshiping god and uh, so some of them would even talk about how they have uh, gone into the spiritual realm they have entered into the heavens and seen amazing things so you, do you see they 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 are kind of duplicating what the holy spirit actually did for believers but this is a fake duplication which satan is bringing in you know in all of these false writings saying that if you have encounters with angels and worship them along with them you can join and do a good thing that is to worship god so they are trying to make it sound spiritual but actually it's involving a lot of uh, demonic activity so uh, this was uh, the mysticism of first century judaism where it was considered very honorable to join with the angels with the spirits in worshiping god but the all but the kind of spirits that they were contacting are all evil spirits fallen spirits uh, whom jesus disarmed and made a public spectacle of them you know sh openly showed that they were defeated that they were disgraced so these uh, mystics of uh, first century judaism were in fact contacting those kind of fallen spirits and so those spirits were obviously not worshiping god at all and whatever they would have whatever visions they would have shown these people of the spiritual realm would have been all uh, fake fake images fake visions which will lead them far away from the truth of god you know so the, the so it so paul here is asking the colossians to avoid such things and he points out one great danger in verse 19 he says they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as god causes it to grow so jesus christ is the head of the church we are the body of christ if we stay connected to the head then we will grow then we will have a future but these people they, they have gone off into this wrong uh, you know mystic teachings they have gone off into the traditions of men and they have lost connection with the head so if they have lost connection with the head this, they're not going to grow anymore you know once the body is no longer connected to the head uh, it's not going to grow it's just going to die so when jesus is uh, is the head he is the brain he is the one that the rest of the body is connected to as long as we are connected to him there will be growth so it's important to stay connected to him and then in verse 20 he says since you died with christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world why as though you still belonged to the world do you submit to its rules so um if you remember when we all were born we were born as sinful fallen spirit beings we were all slaves of these uh, demonic forces of these elemental spiritual forces we were slaves of that but what happened something beautiful happened us uh, happened to us when we placed our faith in jesus christ we were crucified with him we died how can the spiritual elemental forces uh, you know control someone who's dead you're dead 
you were you were their slave but now you're dead you've been happily crucified with christ they can't control you anymore because you're dead and then you rose up as a new spiritual being under new management you now belong to the kingdom of uh, god so now they can't even touch you so that is the special beautiful privilege which we have so he says this is the this is the experience that you had you were crucified with him and when you were raised up as a new i know new, as a born again person you were born into a new kingdom where those where the old kingdom powers cannot even touch you so now why do you want to go back and submit to the rules of that old kingdom he says so do not do that uh, and in verse 22 he says these rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings so he says if you follow these rules and all of that all of that is just destined to destruction it will all be destroyed one day so do not go back to such things is what he uh, says and then uh, verse 23 he makes a very you know uh, important statement he says such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self imposed worship their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence so you know uh, a person who's like set himself apart from the rest of society who's living in a hut barely eats any food spends all his time meditating so you know people may think oh what a good man see he's not involved in the world he has set himself apart he's a sage you know in in our indian terminology he's a rishi so you know they may they may show respect and because that this man appears to have the appearance of wisdom he he it looks like as if he's being very very godly so that is what these these jewish mystics were you know portraying themselves as so self imposed worship false humility harsh treatment of the body all this appears like as if it's very godly and something very spiritual but it lacks any value in restraining sensual indulgence when it comes to controlling the evil on the inside you know your wrong attitudes your your greed your pride your jealousy it can't control those things those are having full reign on the inside on the outside you you look very very nice you know you're always fasting you're always praying you're always singing hymns it you you so the, so the a mystic a jewish mystic would look very nice on the outside but on the inside all the rot is still continuing you know that uh, self centeredness and that jealousy and that pride pride which is you know the the main cause of which adam and eve fell and even uh, satan fell all that is having full reign on the inside so all this um, uh, outward harsh treatment of the body and all of that didn't really achieve anything on the inside so if you come to christ he will make that heavenly circumcision where he literally kill you off i mean you, you the person that you were dies and you are reborn as somebody completely new you know so that christ alone can do uh, for his people so he says um, stay under christ so that you will have the power of christ in you uh, so then we move into the next chapter so we are looking at colossians chapter 3 uh, if we could have someone read out for us the first four verses please Uh, Colossians three verses one to four, please. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, which where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the of God. set your mind on things above not on things on earth for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God amen you said up to 3 yeah verse 4 to yeah verse 4 okay when Christ who is our life appears then you also will appear with him in glory amen amen 
so he's talking about how now you know we are connected to christ it is with him that you got crucified it is with him that you got buried you see and then when you rose up with uh, when you rose up along with him you rose up uh, to the you know the, to the glory which he has now risen up to so in every way you're like like now kind of attached to him your life is now in him so he says since you have been raised with him and now you're seated where he is seated therefore your mind also should be where the rest of you is you know so set your mind on the things which are above because now you are linked to christ you're seated with christ your life is in christ so let your mind be where the rest of you is so do not live like you know citizens of the old kingdom still letting your mind wander about in the old kingdom when you're actually belonging to the new kingdom so he says set your things on things above set your mind on things above not on earthly things and then he says this in verses 3 and 4 he says you died and your life is now hidden with christ in god when christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory is talking about hiddenness and is talking about appearing look at the contrast over here when you died what happened you were crucified with christ you were buried with him and when you rose up you rose up in him now your life is in him so you, uh, he says here for you died and your life is now hidden with christ in god so when god looks at you you he does not see you in all of your imperfections you know every day you're going through a sanctification process every day you're getting more and more refined but you're still not completely perfect right i mean this is a sanctification process that we are going through but because you are hidden in christ when god looks at you he only sees the righteousness of christ he sees you know uh, he sees you as perfect in christ so your life is hidden in christ and then one day when christ you know uh, appears in all of his glory at that time you also will be displayed as glorious in him so you're connected to him in the hiddenness which you're encountering now and you'll also be connected uh, to him in the glory in which he will you know uh, show himself in his second coming because then all the world which is watching will recognize that we are the ones who are sharing in the glory of this Jesus Christ so he says currently right now you are going through the hidden stage the revealing stage and the glory will happen at the second coming right now you're in the hidden stage so stay uh, stay hidden stay safe as long as you stay in him you are covered you are protected and you are you know you're clothing yourself every day in the righteousness of Christ and Uh, the forces of evil cannot touch you cannot harm you cannot destroy you so he says stay hidden stay safe because that is who you are so he, then he goes on to give a long list of you know uh, uh, instructions things that you should be doing which will help you to continue to stay hidden so that you know you'll not you'll not expose yourself to danger so we will look at the details of all of that when we come back from our uh, break yeah thank you